Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and good morning again. Thank you for joining us today. Services matter and trade in services matter, a big time in fact. This is true globally, but rarely more so than in trade between the EU and Singapore. Both economies rely heavily on services and both are amongst each other's most important trading partners when it comes to services. So there's certainly ample reason to be here today uh, for all of us uh, and to discuss trade and services under the EU Singapore Free Trade Agreement. I am Hannes Schlimmann, uh, Director of WTI Advisors, a trade policy advisory firm and a partner with the law firm Bernstein Sontag. I have the pleasure and privilege of moderating today's webinar. Today's event is organized by the EU delegation in Singapore as part of a policy support facility project on the implementation of the EU-Singapore Free Trade Agreement. With the support of the Ministry of Trade and Industry of Singapore, the Singapore Business Federation, and Eurocham Singapore. Allow me therefore to welcome you again on behalf of the EU delegation and its partners. This is the third in a series of outreach events on the EUSFTA. That's a long title, difficult to pronounce. I'm joined here today by a very interesting panel of speakers. Allow me to briefly introduce them and the flow of the program in one go. Her Excellency Ambassador Bjorko will kick us off with her opening remarks in a short while. She joined the delegation just about three weeks ago, three weeks and one day, if I'm not mistaken, ago, from Brussels where she held a series of important posts before, most recently in the cabinet of Vice President Vestager uh, for Europe Fit for the Digital Age, uh, where she oversaw a portfolio that included industrial policy, SME strategy, internal market trade, e-government, and relations with the council. She also served as head of international affairs at the European Commission's DG for Interna Internal Market, Industry and Entrepreneurship and SME, and was the cabinet of the foreign policy chief, Federica Mogherini. In other words, she really knows about services, trade, SMEs, and foreign relations. Ambassador, we are very honored to have you here today. Thank you. She will be followed by Mr. Shunjung Chua, who will share with us Singapore's perspective on trade and services in the EU SFTA. Mr. Chua is the director of the North America and Europe division at the Ministry of Trade and Industry of Singapore. He oversees various economic agreements, including the EU Singapore Free Trade Agreement, the EU Singapore Investment Protection Agreement, and the EFTA Agreement. Shulong was also part of the TPP negotiations, an interesting side here and served as the chief negotiator for the UK-Singapore rollover FTA. We are doubly grateful for you to be here, uh, Shalong, today, knowing that the Singapore Trade Policy Review kicks off at the WTO, in fact, just two kilometers from where I'm sitting uh, at this very moment. Thank you very much for being here with us. Eugene Lim will then provide us with a technical overview of concepts, commitments, and opportunities for services trade under the EU SFTA. Eugene is a prominent international tax and trade lawyer in Singapore, a founding partner of TechSize Asia, WTS TechSize. Perhaps most importantly, he is our team leader in the Fed project, providing external support to the implementation of the EU SFTA to the EU delegation to Singapore. Thanks for being here, Eugene. After Eugene's introduction, we will have time for a few questions to both Chunlong and Eugene before we delve into the three specific sessions. Allow me to introduce the other panelists properly when we get to their sessions. And now just say briefly, thank you for making time today. Claire Whittaker of the European Commission's DG Trade will take us into maritime transport services, one of her core specialties. We will then have the chance to hear from Stéphane Courquin, CEO of CMAGM, uh, CGM Asia Pacific, on some of the industry's perspective on maritime services under the EU SFTA. Um, after that, we will have a short Q&A 
The next session will feature Torsten Behnke, equally a specialist and negotiator at DG Trade, who will introduce us to some of the key aspects of trade in professional services and the thorny issue of recognition of professional qualification. Noel Clehan, Global Head of Regulatory and Public Policy at the accounting firm, or should I say professional services firm BDO, and here as Chair of the European Services Forum, will provide an industry perspective, again, followed by a short questions and answers session. Finally, Jan Saba, uh, who is also a negotiator and expert at DG Trade, in this case, an expert on the movement of natural persons, will introduce the concepts and mechanics relating to the movement of business people under the EU SFTA, in particular, intracorporate transferees, or ICT for the experts and myself. Mark Buchanan, who is the managing partner at the global corporate rela relocation law firm, Fragoman in Singapore, will provide some expert perspectives from the front line of business mobility, so to say. I hope we'll then have time for a few more questions and answers um, before I will uh, conclude with a few conclusions and uh, takeaways. Before we begin, let me make several housekeeping announcements. Uh, it's always a bit boring, but always very important. This webinar, as you would have heard when you logged on, is being recorded. The recording, together with the presentations of our speakers, will be made available through the EU delegation's website and the uh, delegation's YouTube channel. All those who registered for the webinar will receive an email with the respective links to the recording and the presentation. We would like to encourage you to uh, share your questions um, during the webinar um, and do so in the Q&A box underneath your screen, at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you have comments other than questions, comments you do not expect an answer to today, um, please feel free to share those in the chat box. Negotiators are always grateful for feedback. Uh, so anything you want to unload, anything you want to say is welcome there. Questions, please, in the Q&A. We will probably not be able to look at the chat box enough to field your question if you put it there. Um, finally, for those of you posting comments to social media, please do so. Uh, use the hashtag EUSFTA if you can. That makes it nice and harmonious. Um, all that out of the way, allow me now to welcome again and cede quickly the floor to the European Union Ambassador to Singapore, Her Excellency uh, Ivona Bjorko. Ambassador, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. And it's indeed been just three weeks I'm here in charge of this delegation and it is actually my very first a webinar I'm addressing. Uh, so I hope it shows how important for us is FTA with Singapore and its implementation. And I'm really glad to be able to do so today. I wish a good afternoon and a good webinar to you, ladies and gentlemen, and a good morning to those joining us from Europe. It is uh, my great pleasure to welcome you all, as I, I said. And before starting, I'd like to thank my own team for preparing the seminar. They've put a lot of heart in it and I hope it will pay off. I am particularly pleased to see so many companies and stakeholders interested in further exploring the benefits and opportunities under our agreement. The EU and Singapore, as you well know, are solid trade and investment partners. Our combined annual bilateral trade in goods and, and services is valued at over 100 billion euro. This has positioned Singapore as the EU's largest trade partner in Southeast Asia, and it's also top destination for foreign direct investment in the ASEAN region. In terms of trade in services only, Singapore ranks globally as the EU's sixth largest trade in services partner. Our trade in services includes a wide range of areas, such as maritime transport service, computer services, business, professional and consulting services, as well as, as well as the charges for the use of intellectual property. Despite the adverse effects of COVID-19, um, 
on global trade and supply chains, the EU and Singapore committed to ensure the flow of goods and services across borders. We both believe in open, free and free trade as key principles of trade policy. And these principles are strongly embedded in our bilateral agreements. But as we all know, it's not only about bilateral relations. We work together in multilateral fora and together with like-minded countries, including very much so Singapore, uh, the European Union has been engaged in reforming the WTO. We are currently strongly engaged in two WTO negotiations of plurilateral nature on services, e-commerce and domestic regulation. Our EU Singapore FTA provides, as you very well know, specific commitments on cross-border supply of services, market access, commercial establishment in a wide range of services sectors. And as you've mentioned, Hannes, we have with us today an impressive line of speakers. And I would like to warmly thank you for devout, devoting time to us and to our audience. Our speakers will be guiding you through different service provisions of the agreements that are relevant for your businesses, for your daily operations. And I can only encourage everyone to, take, uh, to make the most and the best out of this webinar. I hope it's a unique opportunity to interact and pose very precise questions to our well-informed experts. So thank you very much, and I wish you a very good webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador, and thanks for being here. Well, the first webinar, that's, uh, that's, that's an honor. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you also for your, uh, for your uh, uh, words of welcome, of course, to our next speaker, which I will echo in a second. Um, and from a services expert perspective, let me thank you for uh, pointing out the WTO context and there specifically domestic regulation and e-commerce. I think the first one, domestic regulation, will play uh, a, a role here today. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. Now, before we move on, let's take a look uh, at the results of our initial poll. Um, we asked you uh, whether you are involved in trade and services between the EU and Singapore. Now, only half of the participants had the chance to respond. I suspect that some people logged on late. So let's take the results uh, with a good grain of salt and a bit of humor. Um, but the answer here is 60, 70%, roughly 70% are involved in various roles in uh, trade uh, between England, the EU and Singapore. Many as government officials, some as service providers, some as brokers, um, and some in other forms and shapes. 30% uh, are here because they're interested in, uh, in service nonetheless uh, and are not yet involved. So uh, I think one of our aims should be here today to animate these 30% to get, get personally involved in trade and services between the EU and Singapore. We also asked you about uh, whether in your view, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, whether in your view, uh, the uh, EU SFTA helps in facilitating or in fostering service trade between the EU and Singapore. Now we're only two years into the game, um, but against that background, I think this uh, is actually very encouraging. Um, about 75% of us say, yes, it helps. Um, most say it helps. Some say it helps a lot, 14%, and some say it helps a little um, or to some degree. 24% um, are not sure or say no. Um, the third question we asked was, what is your main interest today? Uh, and you were allowed to tick as many boxes as, as you wanted to. 75%, uh, 73% said, uh, yes, uh, generally trade and services between the EU and Singapore is of interest. 8% uh, said maritime transport services. Um, I encourage all of us to pay good attention to maritime transport services when we get there, because it's a very interesting subject and has a lot of bearing on other sectors as well. Um, uh, only 3% said they're interested in professional services. Again, this is a global, globally relevant uh, matter, so I hope we can uh, extract a lot of juice, uh, even for those who are primarily interested generally. And thirdly, 11% um, said they are interested specifically in the movement of business people. And 5% say they are interested in hearing about other services. Okay, so that um, was quite interesting, I think. Um, let's 
now move on to Shunlong Chua, Director for Europe and the US at the Ministry of Trade and Industry in Singapore. Shunlong, Singapore is of course a champion and front runner when it comes to trade and services at the WTO and, uh, and in its trade agreement, uh, trade agreement um, of which you negotiated uh, and uh, are dealing with uh, quite a few. Um, and the EU is Singapore's biggest trading partner when it comes to services, if I'm not mistaken. So we are keen to ask and hear from you, what are uh, Singapore's perspectives on trade and services under uh, the EU Singapore FTA? Shunong, over to you. Thank you very much, Hannes. Uh, good afternoon, Ambassador Pioko. Uh, and also everyone tuning in from different time zones, if it's a good morning, good morning to you. Uh, I would like to begin by thanking the EU delegation to Singapore, uh, especially Justina, for this invitation and also for organizing this useful series of outreach sessions on the EU Singapore FTA. Uh, the EU Singapore FTA is an agreement of great strategic importance. Uh, it is the first between the EU and an ASEAN country, and it serves as a pathfinder towards an EU ASEAN agreement in the future basically to connect two regions with tremendous economic weight and potential. On one hand, the EU, the largest single market in the world, and on the other hand, ASEAN expected to be the world's fourth largest economy by 2030. The, the agreement also has great commercial value. And as uh, the ambassador has already shared, uh, ambitious, high standard. And for example, uh, both sides agreed to eliminate all tariffs on goods, enhance access to each other's uh, services markets, and also facilitate trade by expediting customs clearance, uphold rule of law, for example, in high standards for intellectual pro property protection, and the list goes on. Um, and I'm pleased to share that it appears that the agreement has been working. Uh, it really helped to support two-way trade amidst the pandemic of the past year and a half. Uh, we are still waiting for the 2020 services numbers to come in. Uh, but I take great comfort in the informal poll that we just did, where essentially about 76% of us present at this uh, forum today, we think that the EU Singapore FTA helps services trade to at least some degree, or if not a lot. Um, but based on what we've seen about goods trade in 2020, as well as uh, investment numbers, I think those uh, have all held up very well. Uh, I'm actually quite confident that it's that there is definitely a positive uh, EU Singapore FTA effect. Uh, and maybe years later, when our economists are able to run their regressions, hopefully the positive effect is a larger one. Uh, for today, I wish to share three statistics and one suggestion on services actually. Um, and I will just go into them now. Uh, the first statistic is that services matter, just like what uh, Hannes has shared. Uh, and to what extent does services matter for EU-Singapore bilateral economic relations? Uh, turns out services trade is as important, if not more important than goods trade. Just a couple of numbers. In 2019, about 45% of bilateral trade between the EU and Singapore was accounted for by goods. About 55%, which is over half of bilateral trade, was services. Uh, to, a, to a certain extent, this should not be surprising. Uh, within Asia, Singapore is the EU's second largest services trading partner. And within ASEAN, Singapore is the EU's top services trade partner. Uh, the second piece of statistic that I want to share, about 75% 70, of services trade between the EU and Singapore uh, is in three categories, intellectual property, transport services, and business services. Each of these segments account for around 25%. And if you look at the picture for imports as well as exports and you compare the two, uh, the picture is roughly symmetrical. Uh, what does this mean? Three observations. First, intellectual property. I think this uh, suggests that there's a lot of sharing of knowledge two ways between uh, companies based in the EU and those based in Singapore. And to a certain extent, I think it also reflects a lot of intra-firm trade of intellectual property between EU companies in the EU and their subsidiaries here in Singapore. Number two, for transport services, I think this really speaks to how Singapore is a two-way 
gateway between the EU and the markets in Southeast Asia. So essentially, there's a lot of services in transport services to sort of move the goods both ways. And number three, in terms of business services, what does this mean? That's uh, professional services, management services, consulting services, R&D services. Basically in line with our idea of how a regional hub in Southeast Asia might look like uh, and consistent with what we know as well. Uh, in 2019, EU's trade in services with ASEAN countries reached about 94 billion euros. Singapore accounted for more than half of that because a lot of the EU companies are using Singapore as their regional hub. The third piece of statistic I wanted to share is that between 2011 and 2019, total services trade between the EU and Singapore almost tripled. So in 2011, it was about 19 billion euros. In 2019, it was over 56 billion euros. And I'm pretty certain that it's on the uptrend as well. But what does this mean? Uh, it means that services trade both ways is surging. There's a lot of growth. There's a lot of jobs. There are a lot of opportunities and for us to satisfy the aspirations of people on both sides. Um, so now that brings us to sort of my, my uh, question and suggestion for today. Uh, the question is, how can we maximize these benefits in services trade for our people, for our businesses on both sides? How can we really move the needle even further and build on the already very high standard and strong foundation of uh, the EU Singapore FTA. Uh, so again, I turn to a piece of statistic to look for clues. So uh, in our government, we've estimated that in 2019, based on uh, the work done by my statistical agencies, that around 65% of services trade between the EU and Singapore were delivered digitally in 2019. And in fact, if I were to look at some earlier years, the number rose past 70% in some of those years. And one can only imagine how much that figure has risen in 2020 and 2021, given uh, how much you know, the digital economy has really grown uh, in the past year and a half with the global pandemic. So my suggestion is a pretty straightforward one. Uh, I think that we should try to look at how we can further activate the digital economy in terms of connectivity, in terms of interoperability of our digital markets so that we really, really move the needle uh, on the digital economy as a horizontal enabler for a large chunk of services trade and increasingly goods trade as well because we are also looking into the digitalization of goods trade. Uh, I'm pleased to note that last Thursday, uh, the European Union announced its strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific and on this, I would say the European Union is really exhibiting thought leadership on the digital economy as a growth area within our region as well. Because uh, I note uh, that the EU has proposed to explore the launch of negotiations on a digital partnership agreement with three partners in Asia, one of which is Singapore, of course. But I would say all three of us, uh, we're probably very keen and very active in this space. So between the EU and Singapore, I think uh, there could be potential for us to start those exploratory discussions and figure out whether perhaps we can upgrade uh, some of the e-commerce sections of the EU Singapore FTA and put in place some form of a bilateral digital economy agreement if that's something uh, appropriate for both sides. Uh, so for, for us here in MTI and in Singapore, we look forward to working with the EU to advance our already very strong and robust partnership in new forward-looking growth areas uh, like the digitization of services and goods trade. Uh, we want to help businesses of all sizes unlock new opportunities in the digital economy. Um, I'm going to end here and wish everyone a fruitful and engaging discussion today. Over back to you, Hannes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Shun Long, for this uh, impressive fireworks of points. I heard strategic, I heard uh, pilot agreement. I think you didn't use that word, but that's what you meant. Uh, uh, I, you may emphasize um, the nature of sharing as part of services trade. It goes back and forth, sharing IP. Um, the role of the regional hub, um, and of course, the reference to digital uh, economy and, and all that that implies. 
I think we're go, going to hear more about this in the weeks and months uh, to come. Um, let me thank you briefly uh, thus, because we have to move on, uh, but we'll hear from you a little bit more in the Q&A perhaps. Um, Eugene, I believe it's now time to take a moment to look at the mechanics and content of the EU SFTA as it relates to trade and services. Um, your explanations and insights on concepts, commitments, and resulting opportunities will, uh, will be much appreciated by our audience, I am sure. Uh, I realize, of course, that in order to do justice uh, to the sheer breadth and depth of the subject, thinking of 160 plus subsectors and 20 plus pages of general uh, commitments, you would now need roughly three to four hours. Um, and then, of course, there's all this business reality to be referred to. Instead, I need to ask you to give us a sharp overview and snapshot in eight minutes. Can you do that? Uh, sure, Hannes. Um, I will definitely try. And um, good afternoon, good morning, everyone, wherever you are. And um, uh, greetings to the ambassador. Thank you also to the EU delegation here in Singapore for the opportunity to present today uh, on trade and services um, in the EU Singapore FTA. Um, and today I will touch on uh, three areas. One, I will introduce uh, trade and services and what it means. Uh, some general concepts. Secondly, I'll talk about the services and commitments um, that uh, are covered in the EU Singapore FTA. And I'll end off with a case study to perhaps whet your appetite as to the opportunities that abound uh, for businesses um, that seek to use the EU Singapore FTA. Firstly, in terms of trade and services, when we think about trade and services, uh, we start off by looking at modes of service supply. And there are four modes of service supply. Uh, mode one would be cross-border services, essentially where a person in a country is delivering a service to a person in another country. So for example, if I'm sitting in Germany or if I'm sitting in Singapore and I'm providing advice to a client in Germany, uh, that would be a cross-border mode of service supply. Secondly, there is mode two, which is called the consumption abroad mode of supply. And that is where a, um, a person travels overseas to a territory of another uh, member state of an FTA in this case, uh, to consume services. So for example, if a European tourist, uh, and, and I know Germany and Singapore now have a uh, corridor. And so if we have uh, tourists from Germany traveling to Singapore to enjoy some retail therapy. Uh, that will be an example of um, mode two um, service supply. Uh, the third mode, and I think this is probably uh, a mode of service supply which would interest many companies that look to seek uh, to set up a commercial presence in a foreign country. Uh, this is the mode of service supply where a service provider in a country sets up a form of commercial presence in a foreign country and this could be by way of a branch, uh, a, a, a company, an enterprise, a partnership, etc. So for example, if you have a French education company that's seeking to set up a subsidiary in Singapore to provide uh, French language courses, that would be um, an example of a mode three uh, service supply. Uh, the final mode, or mode four, is what we call presence of natural persons. And this is where um, a service um, supplier provides services in another country by way of sending natural persons overseas to provide that um, service. So for example, if you've got an Italian consultant that travels to Singapore to provide consultancy services uh, to customers and clients in Singapore, that would be an example of uh, a mode for supply of services. Now, having clarified the different modes of services, then we look at what are the commitments under an FTA and specifically under the EU Singapore FTA. Uh, firstly, we look at market access and essentially um, in the various sectors uh, where commitments have been undertaken, uh, there are commitments to remove barriers and restrictions to market access. And these barriers could take the form in terms of limitations on the number of establishments, the total value of transactions or assets, uh, the total number of operations, total quantity of output, uh, 
uh, total number of employees, etc. Um, and these will look at market access restrictions across the four different modes of service supply that we mentioned earlier. Uh, secondly, a lot of uh, services commitments in F various FTAs and certainly under the US EU SFTA will include national treatment obligations, where essentially a country, uh, a party to the FTA, uh, commits to um, <clears throat> accord the same level of access uh, and treatment to a foreign service supplier as they would accord to a like domestic uh, service supplier. Now, thirdly, and I think this is going to be uh, of particular importance in this EU Singapore FTA, is really looking at commitments that relate to the regulatory framework. Um, there are commitments in relation to the mutual recognition of professional qualifications, and I know we'll, we'll speak about that later, but there are also commitments on transparency. So the, there are certain commitments as to the type, uh, the, the way in which uh, regulations are published and made known to the public so that they can access these uh, regulations. There are also rules on domestic regulation that relate to licensing requirements and procedures or qualification requirements for the provision of services. And this is really an attempt to ensure that market access and national treatment commitments under the FTA will not be frustrated by licensing requirements and other procedural requirements uh, set out in domestic regulation. And we'll see this agenda be moved forward uh, in the various FTAs in, that, that will be concluded with the EU and hopefully with more Asian countries, but also in other um, trade forums as well. Uh, and finally, there are, all, there are also sector specific rules, um, such as computer services, postal services, etc. Now, in terms of um, the types of uh, commitments that are set out in the EU Singapore FTA, I've set out uh, some samples of uh, services in two of the sectors, and there are about 12 different sectors that are committed there where there are commitments in the EU Singapore FTA. Um, numerically, the Singapore, the number of Singapore services may, may see more, but uh, certainly I think uh, in terms of the value of services, uh, they are, um, you know, the, the European commitments are equally valuable. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Now, in terms of services, uh, typically, there's a question as to what are the key benefits uh, for services commitments in FTAs. And uh, I would suggest a few different key benefits. Firstly, anti-rollback uh, measures. And this really prevents governments that are party to FTAs from imposing additional restrictions beyond what has been guaranteed in the EU Singapore FTA. Now, um, countries which are members of the World Trade Organization would have a certain set of baseline commitments that they've made in services under the GATS uh, framework or the General Agreement in Trade and Services. And in many situations, the actual applied restrictions may be more liberal than what has been committed under the GATS framework. And what the EU SFTA will do is it will, in many situations, provide additional commitments that would bind uh, governments to what is currently applied and what this prevents or what this will ensure is that businesses can operate with the guarantee uh, that uh, there will be no future rollbacks on any kind of market access um, rights that have been granted under the FTA. Now secondly there could also be in some situations preferential market access and this is where um, a, a service provider of an FTA member state, so a Singapore service provider or a European service supplier providing services in Singapore, they have better market access uh, compared to foreign service suppliers from non-EU or non-Singaporean uh, countries, um, as the case may be. Uh, thirdly, there is certainty on how domestic regulations will be enacted and implemented. And we talked about transparency and various disciplines around domestic regulation. And fourth, there could also be recognition of professional qualifications, uh, where professionals have access to fair, non-discriminatory licensing and qualification requirements and procedures, and where mutual recognition of qualifications is encouraged under the FDA. And now I set out in uh, my last slide for today, uh, just an example as to how um, a European medical service provider 
could benefit from the EU SFTA, but also having set, set foot and planted the flag in Singapore, uh, how they could also um, maximize the benefit of that establishment. So in this situation, where the Dutch medical company sets up a subsidiary in Singapore, um, they could set it up as a 100% wholly owned subsidiary. Under the FTA, they are guaranteed that market access and uh, there are no future rollbacks on the service commitments. Secondly, domestic regulations must be applied in a manner that is consistent uh, with the various disciplines in the US FTA, especially where they need to obtain various licenses from the Singapore authorities. <clears throat> but having set foot in Singapore, I think it's also important to note that um, the Singapore subsidiary would benefit from uh, the double tax agreement between Singapore and the Netherlands. There will also be uh, bilateral investment protection agreements between the two countries, as well as when ratified, the investment protection rules under the EU Singapore FTA. And in Singapore, certainly uh, you would, the, the, the the Singapore subsidiary of the Dutch medical service provider could also explore the possibility of obtaining various incentives and grants uh, from the Singapore agencies, government agencies. Now from Singapore, the, um, the Dutch medical uh, service provider could then access uh, the network of free trade agreements that Singapore has signed on to. And Hannes has mentioned that Singapore among Asian countries has really been the forerunner of uh, free trade agreements, um, or the conclusion of various free trade agreements with uh, trading partners. But to access all these various free trade agreements uh, from their, using their establishment in Singapore, likewise, a benefit from uh, the network of uh, tax agreements, which would then reduce withholding tax rates in um, various other countries. For example, in Thailand, there could be reductions in uh, withholding tax rates for dividend on dividends, on um, interest repatriations, etc., and also um, um, rely on treaty provisions for permanent establishment protection. And thirdly, also benefit from the various investment protection agreements that Singapore has signed on to uh, either bilaterally or under the um, various agreements through the ASEAN network. Now, in this situation, um, under the ASEAN's, uh, ASEAN services, uh, framework Agreement on Services, uh, Thailand would have committed to increasing its foreign equity restrictions for investments or the establishment of a commercial presence uh, for medical services from 49% to 70%. So here by setting up an entity and using a Singapore subsidiary to invest in Thailand, there would be also a preference that will be enjoyed over, over non-ASEAN um, investors looking to set up a similar business operation in, in Thailand. So I guess there are all these various permutations as to how you can use services, but certainly I'd just like to echo uh, the phrase services matter. And certainly the devil is in the details. And certainly I would also say the benefits are in the details. So with that, I'll hand it back to you, Hannes. Thank you so much, uh, Eugene. And as a German citizen, I'm looking forward to retail therapy when I get to Singapore next. Um, uh, I, I very much liked your uh, example of the service provider using Singapore as, as a center and as a hub, uh, because that's exactly how Shenlong also positioned himself. Shenlong, I suspect you might have things to comment on here. Um, we don't have too much time for this Q&A, but I think we should definitely take a second. Um, and let me prompt you in two ways. First any comments you would like to share. And second, if you uh, are tempted to comment on the benefits that Singaporean companies are currently reaping in Europe when it comes to their exports, you would be most uh, welcome to, to, to do so. Um, also, any challenges you might want to raise um, here uh, to help us understand how we can move the needle, as you said, uh, further, that would, be, that would be welcome. Over to you, Shindong. Uh, thanks very much, Hannes, for the opportunity. Uh, I was going to say that Eugene gave such a wonderful presentation. I think it provides a balanced view of uh, benefits for companies on both sides, actually. 
because many of the commitments in the EU Singapore FTA, I think they were commitments that both the EU and Singapore made. Uh, so I would say that there's a lot of overlap there. Um, so yes, uh, very good examples from Eugene. Uh, and I, I, I was going to actually approach him and ask him for a copy uh, <laughs> as a tip for my own outreach to companies. Uh, if I have just one uh, suggestion in terms of how to move the needle, uh, my sense is that, you know, as we start going into the post-pandemic era, uh, it is not enough to just have the uh, free trade agreements in place, not enough just to have the companies working with each other digitally. I think a lot of the analog touch points and connections are very important as well. So here in MTI, I think we are very keen to look at how we can really try to enable businesses uh, to resume a lot of their essential business travel. I think uh, what we've done with uh, Germany, for example, uh, is just one example of uh, other initiatives to come in the coming months. Uh, so for example, I would have uh, hoped that you know, next year, this particular uh, roundtable could be conducted in person as well, uh, in addition to being uh, virtual. Of course, we've learned a lot of things about how if you do it virtually, you can cut across time zones. And I think that uh, we'll continue to keep, but uh, the in-person analog you know, uh, kind of uh, feel uh, is, is, is something that's still very important. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Yes, uh, I like to focus on analog and the next session will be very practical when it comes to maritime uh, services and shipping. Um, Eugene, of course, also comments from your side uh, of your choosing um, most welcome. Um, I wanted to briefly come back to tax as well. Um, there are, um, of course, recent developments on the international uh, scene, um, which are directly or indirectly, most of them probably indirectly related to the US FTA. Um, if you were to inclined to comment on those, uh, please do so. Um, sure, Hannes. I, I, I think, um, you know, S Singapore has certainly uh, done a great job um, positioning herself as a hub uh, jurisdiction. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, tax has been one of the tools that uh, has made Singapore uh, attractive to uh, many investors. Uh, in addition to the business-friendly environment that we have here, the excellent infrastructure as well as connectivity to the rest of the region. Um, typically, when um, you know, I advise clients about uh, setting up in Singapore from a tax perspective, certainly there'll be a lot of discussions about whether the type of uh, investments that they bring into Singapore and the type of activities that they want to bring to Singapore, uh, whether that would also qualify them for um, you know, any type of uh, tax incentives or grant support from the uh, government agencies, either by way of reduced tax rates on the income tax side or, or grants to, um, to, for example, to train staff uh, as they gear up their operations in Singapore and bring useful skill sets and transfer them to uh, uh, the local workforce. Uh, but um, I think I'd like to make several comments. Certainly, I think there is a lot of discussion of late as to how the international tax environment will change. Um, and um, I will just um, perhaps leave the audience with a couple of um, uh, points. Firstly, I think uh, Singapore uh, has works hand in hand with the international tax organizations to ensure that uh, the tax environment here will continue to be uh, in compliance with the new international tax rules that will be formulated. Uh, and the Singapore government, certainly uh, from my perspective, having worked with the Singapore agencies for many, many, many years now, uh, really have the legislative nimbleness to ensure that uh, when rules need to be enacted to bring our laws in compliance with international norms, uh, we will do that. So that will hopefully give a lot of uh, confidence to European businesses that look at using Singapore as a um, doorway to the rest of the region. Okay, well, thank you so much to, to both of you. Uh, I know that Shulong, we need to lose you at some point. I hope uh, this will be, uh, well, you choose the moment. Uh, I suspect it's, it's soon, but thank you uh, both very, very much. Uh, Shulong specifically also, because I think you need to keep another eye on the TPR that is, uh, that is happening uh, right now. Um, 
Let me uh, then thank you uh, again both and move on. Uh, we turn to Claire and Stefan for our next uh, session. Shipping uh, matters, I use that word twice today, shipping matters like few other things in trade, trading goods that is, but the services themselves are also traded, maritime transport services, and uh, they are big. Effective access to that market is thus doubly important. Um, and we heard about Singapore's role as a regional and in fact global shipping hub uh, already. Uh, Singapore has one of the highest concentrations of international shipping groups worldwide, and, uh, and uh, it offers also a wide range of maritime and related services, ship broking, ship management, insurance, legal services, etc. Um, traffic keeps increasing. Um, the port remained open for operations during the pandemic, so we're looking at uh, one of the most relevant sectors uh, in practical and money terms. Uh, around. Claire, you are a negotiator and specialist at DG Trade, uh, which uh, for those of us not familiar with the structure of the Commission, is the European Commission's trade policy arm. You have negotiated and are negotiating chapters on maritime serv transport services in several of the EU's FTAs. So you are clearly the go-to person for this presentation. So what's in the EU's FTA for maritime transport services? Over to you. Thank you very much, Hannes, and uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on the on where you are. Um, there's a lot in the in the EU Singapore FTA uh, for uh, for maritime transport services, and um, and I'll be happy to explain that in a little more detail um, uh, for everyone in the in my presentation. Um, so, but before that, I'd like to um, provide a little bit of context uh, to explain why maritime transport services uh, are so important for, for trade. And I think that um, Shun Lung already, uh, already pointed to that when he mentioned that 45% uh, of trade between the EU and Singapore is, uh, is in goods. The way most of those goods are shipped is... Um, uh, by uh, by waterborne transport, and uh, 2021 has really been a uniquely dramatic year uh, for shipping. So what you see on this slide is just a few headlines from the last few months, um, and uh, a picture that I'm sure we're all familiar with uh, of uh, of the Suez Canal being blocked by a, by a container ship. And um, and the disruptions in uh, in shipping that we've uh, recently witnessed, ones due to COVID-related port closures or difficulties in crew change, have had um, a, uh, uh, a massive impact on uh, on world trade. Uh, some say that value chains uh, are being reshaped, industry practices are being transformed for the long term. So all of this to say that shipping is an essential enabler of global, global trade. And um, this is one of the reasons why the EU seeks to ensure that in all of its FTAs, including uh, the one of Singapore, um, there are provisions to ensure that maritime transport can take place as seamlessly and, uh, and efficiently as possible. So this is particularly true uh, for the, um, the free trade agreement with Singapore, uh, because both the EU and Singapore have a very strong interest in, um, in shipping. Uh, the EU uh, and its companies operate over a third of the world's fleet in terms of gross tonnage. Um, maritime transport is how 85% of all EU trade is moved. And uh, on the side of Singapore, Singapore is, is the second busiest container port in the world. As we already heard, it's a hub for, for the Indo-Pacific region, or as Shunlun said, uh, a gateway to Southeast Asia. So what, what does the agreement do um, specifically? It, it has very ambitious provisions um, on international maritime transport services, and it's one of, uh, of the examples of high standard for services um, that, uh, that we heard about in, the, in free trade agreements. So its benefits um, include the fact that it covers a very wide range of, uh, of shipping companies. This is what we call the Greek clause. Uh, so this means that the provisions of, uh, of the agreement, which usually only apply to 
um, the strict definition of juridical persons for, for both parties. Also, in the case uh, of this agreement, um, extend um, to certain kinds of shipping companies that don't meet that definition. So that means shipping companies that are established outside of the EU, um, but which are controlled by EU nationals and operate a fleet registered in the EU that flies the EU flag. So, um, so there's a broader range of types of companies covered in uh, the shipping sector than, than in other sectors. Uh, the agreement also features a dedicated chapter on uh, international maritime transport services. This is worth noting because this is unusual uh, for most parties that uh, the EU negotiates with. Um, other parties often do not include such provisions in, uh, in other FTAs, and I'll come back to the specific provisions that that chapter includes in a minute. And um, this, uh, this chapter is complemented uh, by reciprocal commitments. So as Eugene explained, uh, what these commitments do is that um, with them, the EU and Singapore guarantee to apply the obligations of, uh, of the FTA uh, with relatively few limita limitations. Um, so, in practice, um, what does uh, the chapter on um, international maritime uh, transport services do? So its provisions uh, create obligations that go beyond um, uh, strict open market access uh, for international uh, transport markets. Uh, the chapter aims to allow um, providers from both the EU and, uh, and Singapore uh, to provide the full range of door-to-door multimodal transport services. So this, this takes into account the fact that most carriers um, don't just offer shipping services, they offer a range of services um, that, uh, um, that go really from the point of, uh, of picking up uh, or even before of uh, organizing the transport operation to delivery. Um, so this includes uh, in, uh, in practice in the agreement, the fact that um, operators from the EU and from Singapore have a right to contract um, with uh, operators providing other transport modes. Um, not necessarily to provide these, trans these types of transport themselves, but uh, to, um, to find the companies that will do that transport for them. The chapter in, um, uh, in the EU Singapore uh, FTA on maritime transport also um, guarantees a very important point uh, for shipping, which is fair and non-discriminatory access to port infrastructure and services. So that means that when um, a vessel flying either an EU or Singapore flag um, arrives in a port in either of those parties, there can be no preferential treatment for another vessel um, that comes, um, so it's either a local operator or one from a, from a third country. So this means that uh, when that ship um, accesses port services like berthing or loading or unloading facilities, it's always treated um, without discrimination. And this also includes non-discriminatory access to key port services um, like uh, pilotage or tuggage and, uh, and towing services. Um, the, um, the provisions of the agreement also guarantee open access to international cargoes. So this principle of open access is really enshrined in the text of the agreement, but it goes further um, by prohibiting the introduction of certain key types of, uh, of market access barriers. So neither the EU or Singapore um, can introduce cargo sharing agreements, so uh, agreements with uh, third countries by which they would reserve a part of their market for providers from that country, and unilateral measures with discriminatory effect are also prohibited. So finally, to come to the commitments that uh, the EU and Singapore take in um, uh, in, in the field of maritime transport services and auxiliary services, um, these commitments are really very comprehensive. And uh, even though Eugene explained uh, very well what um, types of commitments this can include, I won't really go into the detail. It, this is just to say that uh, what's worth noting is that they cover, so not only international maritime transport of goods and passengers um, with very limited uh, exceptions there, uh, but also a wide range of, um, of auxiliary services so essential for organizing and carry out, carrying out international uh, shipping like maritime agency services, storage and warehousing, or maritime freight forwarding. 
Um, so there are really there are very key benefits to this. Like um, so, mainly the fact that this locks in the level of uh, existing liberalisation. So not every so the EU and Singapore say we're not going to make our um, our legal frameworks any more restrictive than the, they already are, and. Um, uh, and that provides uh, uh, the level of legal certainty that's necessary to uh, uh, to carriers and uh, to other companies to operate uh, both in the short and uh, in the long term. So that's um, that's it from my side on the uh, theoretical, uh, so to speak, side of it. And I'm very happy to hand over to Hannes and Stefan, who will probably give you a more practical uh, business um, uh, point of view on this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claire. Uh, that was succinct and, sh and strong um, in terms of emphasizing how, how these dots really do connect. Um, Stefan, you are the CEO of CMA CGM Asia Pacific, um, and you're based in Singapore, where you are overseeing the development of the shipping uh, business in the region for your company. You have over 30 years of experience in the shipping industry, um, in fact, more than that, you are a graduate of the French École Nationale de la Marine Marchande, so uh, it hardly gets more hands-on than that. Um, Stéphane, thanks for, for being with us uh, today here and as the, the voice of shipping, so to say. So we've heard from Claire how the EU Singapore FTA addresses maritime uh, transport services and also how some of these provisions come about and how they relate to 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 others and to other FTAs. You are running a major international maritime service company uh, that is from Europe. How would you describe the practice of trading maritime services uh, with uh, Singapore? Do you uh, and your suppliers, customers and competitors have the market access and the regulatory comfort you need? Thank you, Ernest, uh, and the EU delegation uh, to Singapore for having me. Um, good afternoon and good morning, ladies and gentlemen, depending on where you are, please. I'm pleased to be uh, representing the CMSG group, uh, a world leader in shipping and uh, logistics uh, uh, in today's sessions. First and foremost, the Singapore government has done a wonderful job in opening up more markets through FTAs for Singapore companies and taking the Singapore brand afar. It ensures that this little red dot remains an attractive trading and investment hub. FTAs, like the EU Singapore FTA, further underlines the strong commitment between the European Union and Singapore, a boost to Singapore's competitiveness, competitiveness sorry, in the global stage where many foreign companies like CMSCG and Group have chosen to set up their regional or global presence in Singapore. Singapore is the Asia Pacific hub for the CMSCGM group, and we, we oversee trade management of all exports from Asia, including Singapore, from here. As the, wor as the world leading maritime hub, Singapore has one of the most conducive operating environments for our business. For instance, the ease of doing business, the infrastructure, special tax exemptions for carriers, the port efficiencies, the embracing of technologies to take the maritime industry forward, the push for the industry decarbonization, as well as the plethora of tech startups that could potentially revolutionize logistics and supply chains, and we are already working with some of them. The FTA concept is not new to local companies or foreign companies based in Singapore. In fact, with the EU Singapore FTA in place, Singapore companies can now price their product more competitively with the removal of tariff on more than 80% of Singapore's export to the EU. So the EU Singapore FTA entered into force just around the time when COVID hit the world last year. Global trading has not quite been the same. We also, we also saw a surge of in, in, in e-commerce in the second half of, of last year. Given the unusual circumstances, 
the long-term benefits and opportunities to be brought about by the EU-Singapore FTA remains to be further leveraged. Thanks so much, uh, Stefan. Now, CMA is providing multimodal transport solutions. Um, so when it comes to doing business with, uh, with Singapore, um, what works, what works less? Uh, would you say that the EU-Singapore Free Trade Agreement um, supports your business model? Um, you know, as, as, I, as I shared earlier, Singapore is, uh, is the Asia-Pacific regional uh, uh, hub for the CMACGM group. This only testifies that Singapore as a strategic maritime hub has a conducive operating environment for businesses like ours. The EU Singapore FTA has indeed put in place a more transparent framework to support our business model. For instance, the FTA parties shall grant no less favorable conditions than that accord in, to its own ships and those of any third country. This has enabled us to operate uh, with uh, full visibility in terms of uh, related fees, charges, custom facilities, and so on. Besides uh, maritime transportation, Singapore's open economic makes, make, makes it seamless for the, for the CMACGM groups to set up our diversified business portfolio here. We have businesses such as logistics, ship management, crew management, and terminal operations set up in Singapore. Our group in France uh, set up the CMACGM Air Cargo Freight Division early this year. With our own aircraft, we have a flexibility to customize air freight services according to customers' needs, as well as developing the sea air offer. Perhaps when the opportunity is right, the EU Singapore FTA could facilitate the freight division's entry into this city state. Moving ahead, I'm confident that the EU Singapore FTA will better facilitate the trade flow between the two regions as the progressive tariff staging uh, kicks in. Besides, the uh, uh, FTA uh, indirectly uh, facilitates the flow of goods to and from the regions through Singapore establishment and for CMSCGM, for CMSCGM, sorry, we will map our services according to where the goods are moving. Mm, okay. So you already referred, thank, uh, thank you for that. You, you already referred to, uh, to the future. Um, are there any uh, other points you would like to uh, see improved in future EU Singapore trade and investment relations when it comes to maritime transport services? Um, indeed, uh, I think uh, the EU uh, Singapore FTA uh, marks a good start to facilitate trade between EU and Singapore. The, the next progression could potentially be an FTA between EU and the ASEAN, a region which is projected to be the fourth largest economic bloc by 2030. For instance, uh, goods uh, flowing between ASEAN and Europe through maritime transport will see quicker documents clearance, greater transparency, and have processes uh, streamlined through a common uh, trade platform. The framework of such uh, FTA will uh, uh, enable uh, uh, better trade and services flow and potentially uplift the uh, economies of the uh, less developed ASEAN member states. Mm. Thank you. Um, let me perhaps bring back uh, Claire and, uh, and, and expand this uh, here. Claire, Stefan has outlined a number of points of interest from the perspective of the shipping industry. Any issue you would like to pick up from what he said? Yes, um, I think it was uh, it was very interesting to hear from uh, from Stefan how uh, how much uh, global um, key players like CMSGM are, are making use of uh, of Singapore as a location as uh, as a hub for um, uh, for Southeast Asia and uh, and the Pacific, and I and I think that. Um, uh, the, what Stefan was saying about the clarity that uh, that the FTA brings, and uh, and the fact that uh, that there is still potential to leverage this, 
um, once uh, once trade comes back to uh, to the level that uh, at which it was before before the pandemic is all it's uh, it's very encouraging. Um, perhaps I could just um, pick up where where he left off. Um, about and uh, and come back to um, your question about the future and uh, and what the next progression could be. So uh, uh, I think that um, that the idea of uh, of further trade agreements in the region is certainly one that uh, um, that's also uh, on the on European minds. <laughs> At uh, at the moment, uh, so the, the perspective of, of an EU ASEAN, ASEAN FTA is one that's uh, uh, that's certainly um, under discussion. There was uh, a recent discussion at, at ministerial level, uh, specifically on uh, on this re uh, on this uh, on this topic to discuss the, the parameters of, uh, of potential future EU ASEAN uh, FTA. But we know that that achieving. Um, trade agreements between two huge blocks like these ones uh, can be a very uh, a very time consuming process so uh, so perhaps I could I could just open up the um, the picture a little bit to uh, to uh, what the EU uh, is doing at the moment in the in the region so implementing the FTA with uh, with Singapore is is one thing um, the uh, the FTA with Vietnam is uh, is now in place and uh, uh, and, uh, and the benefits of that uh, are also uh, are also coming in, and the EU is also looking further with negotiations with uh, with Indonesia, for instance, um, which uh, uh, which uh, which are taking place at uh, at the moment. Uh, we also opened negotiations with Thailand and Malaysia, which which might later also bring to further consolidation in the um, in the ASEAN uh, regions. And and I just like to underline that. Um, Whatever the the progression in uh, the, um, uh, the the Southeast Asia region or the Indo Pacific, uh, maritime transport can be expected to be one of one of the one of the pillars of, of any services agreements in the uh, in the region. It's really it's a it's a key component from the, from the perspective of uh, uh, of uh, of the EU and uh, and one that we certainly intend to um, uh, to make part of uh, uh, of any future agreements. Thanks a lot, Claire. Um, Stefan, um, any last comments? Otherwise, I would have to move on as time is running. Uh, uh, thank you, Claire, for, for, your, for your comments. And, uh, and thank you for, um, I would say, uh, uh, to um, highlighting uh, how uh, uh, the maritime industry is uh, uh, important to uh, our uh, economy. And um, the fact that we are having uh, more and more uh, FTA in the region between uh, uh, UE and, uh, and the different countries of, of ASEAN is uh, clearly a, a benefit for, for the two regions, really. And uh, we could see that uh, uh, more than yesterday, uh, the Indo-Pacific uh, uh, region is uh, very much impo of importance. And uh, when we have uh, the support from uh, EU, and uh, uh, from uh, from the MTI on one side and uh, and all the stakeholders in Singapore, we cannot uh, we cannot uh, uh, fail uh, in in our mission. Thanks so much. Those are indeed uh, um, wise words to conclude this session. Thank you so much, Claire and uh, and Stefan, for this. Um, a quick reminder to everyone to uh, that you are indeed free and invited to submit your questions to our speakers via uh, the Zoom Q&A um, toolbar. Um, so please do so if you have any questions. Now quickly to the third part of this session um, uh, on professional services uh, and their qualifications. Professional services occupy always a good part of the popular Im imagination on services trade, traveling lawyers, globally operating accounting firms, telemedicine, engineering consortia, et cetera. Um, a major challenge in uh, the often highly regulated professions is the recognition of qualifications across borders. Um, and added spice here comes from the fact that that regulation is often self-regulation exercised by guilds and professional associations. I think it's fair to say that trade negotiators spend considerable time on uh, achieving gradual progress in securing effective and real access to uh, professional services market. 
Allow me again to welcome our speakers. Torsten Behnke is a specialized trade negotiator with DG Trade. Uh, his current focus is on recognition of qualifications, which he covers in several negotiations and agreements. Noel Klean joins us uh, today as the chairman of the uh, European Services Forum, ESF, a Europe-wide coalition of services industry uh, and a powerhouse in trade and services. He is also the global head of regulatory and public policy at the global accounting or professional services firm BDO. Thanks a lot to both of you for joining this conversation today. Um, before I turn to Torsten, let's take a quick look at the, uh, at the mini polls that we ran. In your view, does the EU SFTA help in facilitating trade in professional services between the EU and Singapore? Yes, 65%, no 5%, not sure, 29%. Okay, we'll have an optimistic perspective here. Um, in your view, is it easy for EU service providers to obtain recognition of professional qualifications in Singapore? A bit more mixed here, very easy, 20%, easy, 20%, not easy, 30%. And not sure, 30%. So obviously, I think this leaves us with uh, some work to do. Uh, and it perhaps underscores what I just said, a thorny issue. Torsten, um, without further ado, over to you. OK, thanks a lot. Uh, I will just uh, go into the, the first uh, real slide, please. Exactly. Uh, and I'm very grateful that uh, uh, Eugene Lim has already uh, set out uh, the most uh, interesting parts of this so that I don't have to go into the details anymore in the short time we have. That's very welcome. But uh, this slide mainly serves to, to recall indeed that we have three building blocks when we talk about professional services in the US FTA. So the most important part is obviously the commitments on market access and national treatment. And as we have seen, uh, EU has committed many sectors, Singapore has committed many sectors. And uh, that's the essential part of it, of course. However, it is very important as well. It's a, a way of, of guarantee or safeguard to, to, to those commitments that we have strong domestic regulation disciplines. And uh, they are set out a little bit on the right-hand side of the, of the slide. We have uh, a clear, simple, objective, transparent, and pre-established procedures. So it's, it's clear what you are, uh, what, 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 what is the, the subject matter, how will authorities decide which procedures will they apply to, where do you have to apply, and, and how long should it take, etc. Uh, reasonable time periods, as I said. Um, also, how to apply uh, a commitment to make that possible in electronic format wherever possible. Uh, of course, authorities on both sides should decide uh, in an impartial way and independent way that goes without saying in principle. And also very importantly, even though uh, we hope this will not be necessary, there are legal or administrative remedies that must be available in each jurisdiction. So that's the domestic, sorry, not yet, please. <laughs> that's the domestic uh, regulation uh, um, uh, part of it, which is again, a very important safeguard. And the cherry on the cake, so to say, is the professional qualifications um, and the, the recognition thereof. Maybe I should explain very briefly why we do not have a direct recognition of professional services in our trade agreements. Um, the main difficulty is that the EU has 27 member states, as you know, and the member states are competent to determine the level of professional qualifications needed in their jurisdiction, whereas the European Union is in charge of negotiating mutual recognition agreements. So this means there's a multitude of professional services in the member states, there is no full harmonization of all this in the EU either. We have a system whereby we have an automatic recognition for, I think, seven professions. And for all the rest, we have a kind of semi-automatic regime. So with this, 
framework, it would be almost impossible. And even if we tried it, it would probably take a decade to negotiate such direct recognition of services in a trade agreement, which is exactly why, unfortunately, we cannot do this. We do not do this. But what we always do in our trade agreements is to put up a framework for mutual recognition agreements. And uh, these, I should say, are tailored to the needs of the profession. It's professional bodies and authorities. And indeed, it's correct that in many cases, uh, it's not authorities, it's, it's professional bodies who have a say about this. So they need to take the initiative about it, which leads me to the next slide, please. And um, this is, again, as a starting point, this is the procedure that we would have to follow. Um, I thought I put up the slide in order to explain that things are simple, but it might look complicated, but that's why I will guide you through. So very important before I start about the mutual recognition agreement, which I said is kind of the cherry on the cake, is to say that regardless from this, individual uh, recognition decisions remain, of course, possible. And it's as well possible that any jurisdiction unilaterally recognizes certain professional uh, qualifications from the other side. And I don't know how I should put the 30% don't knows and 30% hmm, not sure uh, on the recognition of professional qualifications, but I'm just uh, an optimist and say maybe the percentage that is not sure have not tried it to get individual recognition in the absence of mutual recognition agreements with Singapore. So coming back to uh, how that works in practice, as I said, it's a bottom-up approach. The idea is that it's the profession that tells us their needs. And when I say us, it means, of course, both sides. I'll explain that, that later on. Um, professional bodies and authorities have to make the first step. And they have to make a joint recommendation. They have to say what they have in mind and whether the regimes are compatible at all, otherwise, such an agreement would make little sense if there would be no compatibility at all. And the other element is the economic value. So would it make sense? What is the number of services traded? And to be very clear, we do neither expect a fully fledged legal text that has been discussed with uh, trade law firms, nor do we expect a kind of commission impact assessment on this when we talk about economic value and compatibility of regimes. But it is the professional, bodies or authorities that know best how and whether that could work in practice and what would be the gains for each side. So these joint recommendations would have to be sent to the Committee on Trade and Services, Investment and Government Procurement, a lengthy name, but the uh, reasons to have those committees is exactly that this is a lighter procedure than to go through a complete fully fledged FTA negotiation and ratification procedure again. So it's the parties, EU and Singapore, that would negotiate it. And this would take place under the auspices of the Committee of Trade and Services. The committee would have a look on whether what the trade, uh, what the, what the uh, professional uh, authorities or bodies have suggested um, would actually be consistent with the trade agreement. And normally it, it, it would. So then an agreement would be negotiated on that basis. And of course, each party would have to fulfill its internal requirements to have a mandate for, for concluding such an agreement. And in the end, there would be a legally binding text between Singapore and the EU. And for those who know a little bit the EU system, to illustrate again that this is a lighter procedure, it's a procedure according to Article 218, Paragraph 9 of the Treaty on the European Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union, which means we need a mandate from the Council. They will uh, uh, approve that. And then we conclude with the Singaporean side, which themselves would, of course, have to fulfill their, their internal requirements and have a mandate. Then we would have a legally binding text between Singapore and the EU. So to sum up this, if, if it's, it's, it's a bottom up approach, it needs to be launched by the professional associations and bodies. It will take some time, but it will, will be much quicker than a fully fledged negotiation of a trade agreement. And I usually to anticipate a little bit what, what uh, I will be asked. Uh, no, we don't have a mutual recognition agreement with Singapore. Uh, 
And uh, no, we don't have any other agreement on professional qualifications with any other country yet. But I can tell you we are uh, negotiating one with Canada on architects. And of course, we hope that's my encouragement to fill the encouragement clause with life. We hope, of course, there will be more of them with all our trading partners, including Singapore. And um, that, I think, would be it from my side and open to your questions. Thanks a lot, Austin. Um... I'm um, uh, cutting off my spontaneous comment now in the interest of time and hand over to Noel. Noel, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Hannes, and uh, thank you, Thorsten, for setting the scene. Uh, my thanks also to the EU delegation in Singapore and the ambassador for organizing today's webinar. And indeed, good morning and good afternoon to all the participants. I'm speaking, as you said, uh, Hannes, on behalf of the European Services Forum today. But I'm also drawing on my insights uh, from my day job at BDO, a global professional services organization, and as a member of the EU ASEAN Business Council uh, Executive Board. Uh, I'm not nearly as expert on the technicalities of trade as, uh, as some of the other people on the call today, but I do hope I bring maybe um, a real world business trip uh, um, commentary, not to say that anyone else is not real world, uh, but just to, to comment uh, as it is seen from the business community. I'd like to start by saying that you know, the ESF very much welcomed the EU Singapore FTA when it was ratified in 2018 and came into force in November 2019. We'd also submitted papers and ideas to the European Commission over the rather lengthy uh, negotiation, negotiation period, which I think was from 2010 to 2017. Others have already mentioned some of the key statistics uh, covering trade between the EU and Singapore, particularly in services, and, and as you said yourself, services matter. Uh, a number of facts I think are worth repeating. Uh, the EU is the largest exporter of uh, services in the world and enjoys a positive balance of trade with Singapore in both goods and services. Singapore is the largest trading partner of the EU in ASEAN and the fifth largest importer of services from the EU, as well as the fifth or sixth largest exporter of services in the world and fourth largest exporter of services to the EU. That probably baffles everybody, too many statistics probably in retrospect. But as you, uh, the ambassador certainly said, depending on how you measure it, uh, at least 50, maybe up as far as 55% of total trade between the EU and Singapore are services. Uh, so we welcomed the uh, FTA in 2018, in particular because it can contain specific provisions on services and a framework for the EU and Singapore to recognize each other's professional qualifications in certain professions. And Eugene's uh, slides earlier were excellent in that regard. S some two years on, however, uh, and recognizing the impact of the totally unforeseen pandemic and how that has affected global trade. I have to say that it's difficult to assess the impact of the FTA on professional services. Um, there has been strong growth and had been strong growth in trade between the parties anyway, that the EU and Singapore, uh, long before the coming into force of the FTA, probably as a result of existing strong relations uh, and the momentum and dynamic of, you know, when negotiations uh, are initiated. Um, but one of the challenges we face as a business community in, in, uh, in assessing the impact of trade and professional services is that um, all the things have started to improve. The collection of trade and services statistics by Eurostat in Europe uh, always lags that of trade in timing terms and is in very bigly, uh, significantly less detailed. And another factor, I suppose, is that trade and services often moves in line with trade and goods, uh, particularly for services related to goods trade. So if goods trade have risen, has risen, uh, services are likely to have risen also. But is that a as a result of uh, goods rising or some uh, mechanisms within the FTA? Uh, so all in all, uh, not to get into it too detailed, but we're unable to form a definitive con conclusion as to how quantifiably uh, the FTA has impacted on trade in professional services uh, between the EU and Singapore. If I could move to um, professional services, oh, sorry. Uh, my camera seems to have gone off. Um, to, to mutual recognition of professional services, we're not aware of any initiative, and I think Thorsten has just confirmed that since the FTA came into force, that might result in a mutual recognition agreement um, being agreed between um, the EU and Singapore. Uh, in, in our view, uh, and while Thorsten laid it out very clearly and, and succinctly, uh, but notwithstanding that, we, we think the procedure to generate a mutual recognition agreement in any given profession is too complicated, uh, requiring the professions to generate proof uh, of economic um, value 
in formulating the uh, recommendation to the uh, to the committee that he referred to. Uh, I'm re reassured, having heard him speak, that you know that, that it's not a kind of a scientific, economic, econometric paper that's required. But nonetheless, it's off-putting in the out at the outset for a professional body to have to initiate that economic value assessment. In addition, there's no detailed framework or obvious means to encourage bodies to initiate the process, uh, unlike the Canadian agreement, um, which you referred to. Uh, for some professions, including my own, which is essentially accountancy, uh, but admittedly not all professions, uh, the FDA is almost irrelevant. Uh, and, and I don't want to be uh, pejorative or, or critical. Uh, it's a very important agreement. We welcome it. It's an excellent agreement uh, for its time. Uh, but it, it hasn't been de facto bypassed uh, by some professional services industries uh, by having local partners locally established and part of a global network. And I'm thinking of the BDO firm, for example. BDO in Singapore uh, is unaffected by the FTA and it deals with the rest of the BDO network around the world you know, without any regard to any of the provisions in the actual FTA. As a consequence, uh, the, pressure, the pressure to secure uh, an MRA is significantly less from within my profession, for example, as cross-border business can carry on without advancing towards an MRA anyway. So we would encourage the uh, EU and the Singaporean government to refine and develop the uh, mutual recognition professional qualifications framework, perhaps along the lines of that uh, in the CETA, EU Canada deal, uh, and to actively encourage uh, professional bodies to engage with each other, that's Singaporean bodies and EU professional bodies. Um, the, the article covering mutual recognition of professional qualifications uh, appears to be silent on how to regulate any MRA that might come into being, so perhaps that could be looked at also. Uh, and lastly, the CETA arrangements were, um, as again Thorsten mentioned, architects are progressing their MRA very well as I understand it, show the benefits of having professional bodies central to the process rather than relying on uh, the EU uh, Singapore FTA uh, on the government to government to negotiate the actual MRA on the back of the recommendation that the professional bodies might make. Um, we did welcome, and we still do, the provisions around qualification recognition, uh, but also commitments to market access and national treatment, which uh, one of the earlier speakers referred to, uh, regulation and licensing and so forth. But we, as I said, cannot identify noticeable growth in professional services rising from the, uh, the FTA itself. Um, I'm conscious we're, we're running tight on time, but uh, I've seen the statistics many times uh, that says that um, perhaps uh, there are 17,000 European companies with some form of presence or engagement with Singapore. Um, and uh, my, my um, hypothesis would be that those in the professional services sector had actually already secured their positions and the FTA was a nice to have, but its primary effect was to secure a legal basis for their activities and prevent rollback as I think uh, Shun Lung or Eugene said earlier. Uh, if, all, if that is all is achieved, it is of course still welcomed. Um, so uh, in conclusion, I would say it's too early to say if the FTA um, has made appreciable difference to uh, the growth of bilateral professional services. Um, it does codify good practice, it prevents rollbacks and future discriminatory behavior, and that is reassuring. Uh, and it also you know, uh, is very helpful around preferential market access and certainty. Uh, um, but we do think more needs to be done to encourage professional bodies to initiate the MRA process um, by way of guidelines and a framework. Um, I would say also, and this maybe is probably more of a political observation than a trade technicality, but it was an agreement between two already like-minded parties uh, and perhaps was as much driven by the, uh, the need to respond to the uh, failure to advance a region to region FTA as much as it was uh, growing bilateral EU Singapore trade. But nonetheless, it is a pathfinder uh, for region to region uh, um, trade agreement in the future. Um, for sure, mobility of people is key for professional services. And the general feeling of our members has been that Singapore is very open and places few hurdles in the way of uh, business visitors, temporary intercompany contracts, or fly in, fly out, for example. And I'm, I'm aware the next panel will, will deal with that area. And obviously I'm ignoring the COVID dimension in this. Um, but a side issue uh, worth reflecting on for the future is whether the actual pandemic will cause a permanent reduction in corporate travel and whether professional secondments would be less common as businesses adjust towards more uh, environmentally sustainable business model. Uh, it's not a trade issue, but it can be a very real issue in terms of whether businesses are even interested in uh, fully leveraging the FTA on professional services. And lastly, by way of specific suggestions, I think Shun Lung mentioned it. Um, 
we would like to see a, a digital trade chapter in, in any upgrade of the FTA, uh, reflecting the EU views on uh, cross-border data flow, and also maybe drawing on the language that Singapore itself uses in its um, digital agreements uh, with, with uh, Chile and New Zealand. And perhaps this will happen as a result of the recent uh, EU announcements around uh, digital partnerships uh, with countries in the region, including Singapore. Uh, lastly, just uh, out of the box suggestion, uh, we would like to see improved commitments in Singapore in any future upgrade um, on financial services, matching those offered to the US. Um, but that was really uh, maybe just a bit of an out of the box suggestion, not specific to professional service per se. So I'll leave it at that. Hannes, I know you're tight on time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Noah. Yes, a little fireworks at the end. Uh, Torsten, I will, uh, I will not uh, ask a specific question, but rather suspect that you might want to uh, respond or comment. Is that true? Indeed, with pleasure and, and very briefly so that you can decide whether there will be time for others here and uh, for, for other Q&As. Um, so yes, uh, just the comparison with CETA, I don't think the framework is that much different for MRAs. The difference is that in CETA, we have guidelines attached, we have, which we also have for the, for the TCA with the United Kingdom, but uh, these are non-binding and they are indeed supposed to be a help for, for, for the professional bodies or authorities. Uh, but otherwise, I wouldn't say that, that it's much easier under CETA than under the US FTA. The framework is, is very, very similar. Um, also coming back, indeed, uh, the, the free trade agreement, even though it doesn't apply at individual level, you cannot invoke it before the courts as an individual business, which is the case with uh, every FTA, um, at least of the EU. Uh, it provides legal certainty, and I think that's that's a good point. And even though um, uh, Noel said that largely the structures have been there before, I don't think this is necessarily bad. It provides legal certainty because it can be it can be enforced between the between the parties, which hopefully will never be necessary. But that's the additional uh, um, the the added value, I'd say. A little bit on the on the digital side, uh, well noted. I should say that the, currently the priority are the WTO negotiations on e-commerce for us. And uh, of course, Singapore is, is a part of it. They're even a co-convener of this. Um, and yes, also, uh, obviously the, the US FTA was negotiated before we had more and more refined uh, clauses on, on uh, before we had more refined digital trade titles in our trade agreement. But of course, updating it would uh, uh, require a fully fledged procedure of negotiation ratification, which can take many years. But uh, that, of course, uh, doesn't preclude us from looking at indeed digital cooperation agreements, which we have set out. It has been mentioned already in our Indo-Pacific strategy. So uh, I'm I'm optimist that we will see developments uh, there, medium to mid term. For the short term, again, uh, WTO e-commerce is is our priority for the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are out of time for this session, uh, but Noel, I do want to give you the last word if you want to take it. Um, any issues you would like to highlight uh, other than those that you have already uh, referred to? Uh, well, thank you, Hannes. Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, just to reiterate, we welcome the FTA. Uh, it's an excellent agreement. It does probably need to be freshened up given the developments in the world we live in since 2018. Um, uh, I think if there was any immediate thing that we'd like to see happen, and of course it's driven by public health, is um, the, the, the uh, reopening of essential travel between Europe and Singapore, not just Germany. Um, I think uh, the corridor with Germany is a welcome start, but I think if the FDA is to be fully leveraged, people need to be able to travel. But I'm very mindful that public health is the first concern. Uh, on the other hand, um, full leverage of it will only ever happen when people can travel from Europe to Singapore and vice versa. Um, but very positive, except we cannot positively identify the uh, increase in professional services trade as a result of the FTA. We're sure it's happened, we just can't determine what the uh, quantity is. Thanks again, Noel, and uh, thanks for this reference to the statistics and the things we don't know. It's indeed very difficult to measure trade in services, um, but um, that only means we need to uh, provide more feedback and discuss perhaps even more what exactly can be done. And today's discussion was, I believe, part of that. You gave me um, a wonderful uh, a way into the next session, uh, Noel, uh, by referring to um, travel, movement of service providers and other business people 
uh, is what we need to come to now. As we all found out during the pandemic, business travel is or was perhaps a bit overrated. Uh, much can be done uh, through video conferencing. Thanks for all of us to, uh, for doing just that today. Um, but that said, the movement of physical persons, service providers, their employees, business sellers, et cetera, uh, continues to matter greatly for effective trade and services. Uh, Shun Lung called it the analog. Um, not least for intra-corporate uh, transferees. Um, and people who relocate across borders within service supplying companies in particular, these are the intra-corporate transferees, uh, from a mother company to a subsidiary or branch uh, the other way around or uh, laterally. In fact, we have several panelists in our fold who have done or are doing just that. Um, so both the importance and the sensitivity of moving people across borders are obvious. Um, so what about the FT, EU SFTA in this uh, uh, context? Um, we'll find out uh, soon enough. Um, before, uh, so let, let me turn to our speakers. Um, uh, we wanted to run a little poll. I'm not sure that has happened, um, but, let me just jump on, here it is. Please click as you see fit. Uh, take 30 seconds that it takes. Um, while I, I uh, uh, look at, while we look at this, Jan, um, you are a trade negotiator uh, at the European Commission. You are specializing in trade and services and you do, so to say, mode four for a living. You previously worked in the European Commission's Director General for Home Affairs, where, and this is why I'm mentioning it, where you helped develop an EU-wide admission scheme for intra-corporate transferees. That's quite an achievement, in fact. Um, against that background, can you give us an introduction to the movement of service providers and other business people under the EU SFTA here? Over to you. Yes, thanks very much, Hannes, and hello to everyone. Um, indeed, so this Part of the agreement sits in the services and investment chapter. It is sometimes called mode four supply and services, but really in modern agreements, it, it affects all sectors. It is important for investments. It's important for the trading goods, um, the movement of natural persons, which, which accompanies these, uh, these economic activities is sometimes restricted and that then uh, cascades into the trade relationship. So old agreements, um, this has, agreements have had these provisions for quite some time, uh, even going back to the guts but they are sometimes limited and quite scattered. So for example, in the EU's own commitments, you will see that the durations of stay can differ from member state to member state. There can be a very limited list of sectors to which the commitments apply. Uh, sometimes you'll find labor market tests, which means that you have to first look for a person locally before you can get your, uh, your foreign uh, um, expert or, or manager in. Um, and sometimes you have shortage occupation lists, which can be a, a, a variable, uh, a moving target, so to say, and, and reduce the legal certainty. So all this can, can greatly reduce the value and the legal certainty for, for international companies uh, when it comes to moving their, their staff around. Now, this has its origin in the fact that commitments on this are linked to immigration and employment policies to some degree. Um, when, you, when you discuss these things in a trade context, you have to be quite uh, circumspect of these other policies. Um, but commitments do exist and they do have, have quite, a, quite a significant impact. For example, um, in the EU Singapore FTA, it's a relatively short section. But the typical trade commitments of market access, which you will find in the general obligation, are translated there into quite meaningful commitments of not having quota and not having uh, economic needs tests or labor market tests. So um, this is, this is uh, something you will find in modern FTAs. And um, if you then look at the reservations, um, this can combine into quite a strong guarantee of future openness as well. And it's worth mentioning too that at in any agreement, including this one, uh, these commitments set out a minimum level of openness. So most countries can be more lenient than their FTA commitments uh, indicate. And this is actually happening in practice in quite a lot of, uh, of jurisdictions. Um, they mainly ensure that the level of openness will not be reduced, reduced in the future below the level agreed in the FTA. 
So for example, if you have a sector or a profession where a labor market test is removed, a party cannot re reintroduce that later. I believe this is quite a significant advantage of, of any such agreement. Um, it should also be pointed out that these commitments do not apply directly. So a trade agreement in itself is not a law. Um, it has to be implemented in law. This can sometimes make it hard to see how the trade commitments are reflected in law. Um, a country might use different terminology. Um, a country might also use a one size fits all for uh, labor migration. Uh, I can give the example uh, domestically, for example, of Sweden, which has quite a liberal scheme for, for admitting labor migrants. And that then can be used for a variety of categories covered by trade agreements, not intercorporate transferees there. Indeed, there is a separate scheme available, but you will not find the terminology that you see in a trade agreement necessarily translate directly into national law. It's the commitments that have to be translated. So you, you, could, you have to make sure that your law provides the access that you uh, promise in a trade agreement, but how you do that is really up to the local. Um, yeah, there are varieties and, 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 and variations locally on how to do that. So indeed, successive agreements since the GATS have improved these commitments. Now we have uniform durations of stay, which is also what you'll find in the agreement with Singapore. And the definitions of these categories have now become fairly stabilized as well, which certainly helps uh, transparency and helps uh, international movement of, of business people. Um, for us, uh, for the EU, a milestone was the introduction of an EU-wide admission scheme. This helps our negotiations because now we can harmonize conditions and we can also harmonize our commitments in this category. But the rollout across the member states took several years. So this is again testimony to the difficulty of this policy domain, uh, which you will see uh, in, in, in many other countries as well. Um, the categories of persons that are covered in the EU-Singapore agreement can be seen on this slide. Um, I would simply like to group them under two uh, headings here. One is linked, linked to an investment, either prospective or an actual investment that already exists. So this is more of an interest to multinational uh, groups which have establishments or, or brand, um, in, in, in the, both in the EU and in Singapore. And a, a second category are the salespeople. Um, this too is an improvement on earlier agreements because here we are focusing on people who are selling either goods or services. So again, you see this feature in the trade and services chapter, but clearly this is a category that goes beyond services. Um, Linked to an investment, it's uh, easier to negotiate for immigration authorities. Um, they have a local establishment to which they can turn for uh, various administrative requirements. Um, and hence, you see that that um, agreements more and more take commitments not to have labor market tests anymore for intracorporate transferees. And this is a significant advantage. Now, one thing that the agreement does not cover is spouses. Um, you will see this in, in, in agreements that are being negotiated or more recent agreements. Um, in practice, spouses in the EU are allowed and they have unrestricted access to the labor market. So this is an example of where you would have a more open regime in practice than, than what you actually bound for future generations in a trade agreement. Um, one more thing to mention is maybe that the agreement leaves certain policies untouched, for example, visa policy. Now, this is less of a concern, I think, for Singaporean nationals. Um, but it might be in other negotiations. And then certain uh, rules as regards labor and social security are also out of scope of, of trade policy in general. So this trade agreement would not affect them. Uh, this can be an advantage or a disadvantage. And then rules on regulated professions, for example, also continue to apply. Um, if I would take the example of somebody with a legal function within an enterprise, that person can be transferred as a specialist, of course, within the enterprise. Uh, many people have that profile. But if that person were to practice then law before a court, um, other rules might kick in. And that would not be necessarily a uh, subject of, to, of these commitments. You'll find rules on that in the reservation. So, so that, that might be a bit more complicated than uh, than a simply no labor market test and no quota. Um, the slide I have here captures all these elements. I put it up because the jargon can be a bit, um, they're long terms uh, to use, uh, business visitors for establishment purpose and so on. So I put this slide up here to have a frame of reference, um, but I'm happy to take uh, questions as well afterwards. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Jan, for, for this. Um, we have the poll results. Um, thanks to uh, those people who quickly did click. Um, we asked, in your view, has access to Singapore for business people improved on the, the US FTA? 27% said yes, no, 9%, uh, and not sure, 64%. So there is some information work to be done, Jan, here. Um, Jan and, uh, and Mark. Mark, of course, is doing that for a living. <laughs> 
Um, second question was, in your view, is access to Singapore easy for physical people from the EU, thinking of those intracorporate transferees, but also professionals, maintenance workers, etc. No one said it's very easy. <laughs> one third said it is easy. One third said it's manageable. And one third said it's difficult. Um, I would think that this is probably an encouragement to do more and to keep to keep plowing ahead. Yeah, and thanks for that. I would love to delve into the, the EU-wide recognition scheme, uh, but perhaps just to say, getting 27 member states to get admission on seven uh, in seven categories is already quite an achievement. Um, I'm saying this as a as a as a trade lawyer who <laughs> who touches these things sometimes. Um, Mark, without further ado, over to you. Thanks, Hans. Uh, so I'm very um, glad to be here, and, and thanks, Jan, for setting the scene uh, so thoroughly. Um, so I think um, with Singapore immigration, um, it is um, becoming more and more um, complicated. Um, so it was one of the easiest places in the world um, to move to Singapore and um, to process an employment pass. And the authorities have um, an incredible system uh, for doing that. Um, however, over the last few years, um, it has become more and more complex. And um, one of the complexities is um, labour market testing. Um, so uh, with labour market testing, um, it's become more important uh, to have a free trade agreement, um, which might apply. Um, how, however, saying that, um, you know, Singapore um, does make it easy for business travellers, um, especially from um, Europe. Um, so, um, in fact, um, you know, Singapore, um, in many ways, you know, makes it easier than even under a, a free trade agreement. Free trade agreement. Um, so, um, especially for travellers from Europe, it's possible to come for 90 day visits um, at a time, uh, not 90 days in the calendar year. So, in, in some ways. Um, you know, the current rules are, are generally freer than under a free trade agreement. Um, but uh, what's important to note is that um, it's necessary to get a work pass in order to carry out work um, type activities in Singapore. And uh, usually that's uh, the employment pass. Um, and it's become increasingly more complicated um, to get the employment pass. Um, and especially with, with the fair consideration framework, which is Singapore's way of saying labor market testing. Um, so, um, in order to um, bring someone in, um, it's important to understand the requirements under fair consideration framework and look at the relevant exemptions. Um, and, and one of the exemptions um, is under the free trade agreement. Um, however, there, there are also exemptions um, which apply more generally. Um, so, if you've got less than 10 people in the company, um, then you don't need to advertise. Um, and if a person earns more than 20,000 per month, it's also not necessary to advertise. Um, so it's a small question of um, if you want to bring someone into Singapore on an urgent basis, um, is it uh, better to go under the free trade agreement? Um, and a lot of companies um, were looking under free trade agreements you know, for a solution um, because usually companies want to bring people into Singapore ASAP in order to start the business. Um, so, um, for, for many years, um, you know, free trade agreements were something that companies looked at, um, but that's become more and more difficult, and I'll explain why in due course. Um, so, um, it is important, um, you know, for, for Singapore to look at all the options. Um, certainly, you know, does the EU FTA um, help, or is it better to just more generally um, apply for an employment pass? Um, because there, there are restrictions um, in terms of coming as an intra-company transferee. Um, so it's important to bear that in mind. Uh, going back to the categories um, under uh, free trade agreement, um, it's important um, to look at you know, who's covered. Um, so it's um, key personnel. And um, Jan, Jan's um, highlighted the different categories and especially uh, intra-corporate transferee. Um, because intra-company transferees uh, need to get an employment pass. Um, but um, there are definitions um, under that. Um, so it's necessary to show, uh, well, number one, that the person has been working for a related company overseas um, in, in the head um, office uh, for at least one year. Uh, and then it's necessary also to show that um, uh, the person comes under one of the definitions, um, either executive managers 
um, or specialists. Um, and the Singapore government are interpreting the definitions um, very strictly. Um, so quite often, you know, companies um, think that, um, yes, you know, it's an intercompany transferee, we're transferring someone, uh, that person must come under the definition and that must be a, an easy option, but that's not um, always the case. Um, so um, for executive and managers, you know, the authorities are, are really looking at um, very senior people who are making the decisions, um, who've got the right to hire and fire. And um, not, not, that's not always the case. Um, quite often, you know, companies when they're opening up, you know, they still want to manage uh, the office from overseas. And it may be that the person um, who's being sent over has a managerial title, but um, it's quite clear from the CV that, you know, that they're not within the definition. Um, also, um, the definition of specialist, um, the authorities look at it from the perspective of does the pers person have proprietary knowledge of, of what the company is doing, as well as, you know, do they have a very high level of um, expertise? And um, what we see is that um, the authorities, you know, will um, review the application. Um, and, you know, if um, the application is under the exemption, so it's not necessary to, to advertise, um, then they'll exercise their discretion and quite often they'll do that quite strictly. And if they don't think that the person comes within one of these definitions, then the application is likely to be rejected and it's then necessary for the company to advertise for 28 days uh, before deciding to bring in a foreigner. Um, so it is important um, to decide, you know, is, is it best to go under the exemption um, under the free trade agreement um, or is it best to advertise? Thanks. Um, maybe if we can. Yep. Um, as mentioned, um, there are also restrictions um, under the um, ICT route. Um, and um, in the last year, the authorities have really tightened up on this. Um, Jan mentioned that um, quite often countries will be even more relaxed than um, under the provisions of the FDA. Um, but what we're seeing is that uh, the Ministry of Manpower um, is interpreting um, ICT um, very strictly under all um, FDAs, um, not just EUS FDA. Um, so um, if the FDA doesn't um, specify that uh, dependents are included, um, they're regarded now as being excluded. So this is actually quite a significant change. It used to be that um, MOM um, would allow dependent passes to be applied for. Um, however, um, now, the um, Ministry of Manpower look at the FDA and uh, the US FDA doesn't um, provide for, for dependents. Um, so it's, it's something we've seen as well, where companies um, have applied for employment passes under this route. And then um, the assignee is bringing in dependents and it's then necessary to um, withdraw the application and, and reapply. Um, under the normal route after having advertised in order to be able to bring independence. Um, so it's also important you know, to bear in mind that um, this is you know, um, an exemption for temporary um, assignments. Um, so as far as the authorities are concerned, um, it allows companies um, to bring in foreign talent um, in order to build up the business to transfer um, knowledge and expertise um, to Singaporeans. Um, so um, the, the intention is um, for it to be uh, for three years plus two years under the EUS FDA. Um, so what Ministry of Manpower has said is that um, they won't grant um, new work permits um, under other companies um, and they won't grant permanent residence uh, for applicants under this route. Um, so it's really important that um, the employee understands these limitations. Uh, what we're seeing is that um, Singapore it's a fantastic place to live. A lot of people have heard about Singapore and um, it may be that um, the intention is for it to be a temporary assignment, but quite often uh, people want to stay on, they want to localize. And in many cases, it's in the interest of the company as well. Um, so it's important to you know, bear that in mind and decide whether to go under the FTA exemption um, or to um, apply for a regular employment pass under the normal route. Um, so that's a very quick uh, run through of the pros and cons and some of the considerations you know, to bear in mind. It may be advantageous to go under the FDA um, and we, we see that you know, where someone's going by themselves, it's a really urgent assignment and there's good reason you know, to apply and it's quite often 
a lot faster because you don't need to advertise. There's less scrutiny by the authorities, um, but it's, it's important to bear um, balance out the, the pros and cons. Um, so thank you very much. I'm happy to, to answer the questions as well. Thanks so much, Mark. Uh, a lot to take in, in fact. Uh, let me quickly uh, go over to Jan. Uh, and again, invite anyone to pose questions. Uh, we only have a few minutes left. Um, Jan, Mark illustrated how the normal route is, is, is often the one taken um, rather than the one under the FTA. And he has also illustrated what issues are uh, people are facing in, in reality. My question to you is, could the EU SFTA be further mobilized to help? Is this an encouragement to Singapore and the EU to consider upgrading it in due course? We noted the difficulties. Are there any expect specific expectations worth mentioning already here? Yeah, thanks a lot. No, this was an interesting presentation because indeed it shows that um, a country can do better than what is in the FTA, but a country can also try to interpret the FTA in a restrictive way, which then, um, of course, um, makes it uh, relevant only for a limited number of cases. And I think here the FTA will probably help uh, against any any regression below the level of openness that was agreed in the FTA. So I think this this is certainly a boon. But the elements that are missing from the FTA, of course, is something that you will probably find in other agreements, uh, spouses. Uh, I also see if you have several admissions channels in place, which could apply to the same person, it might help to have some kind of transparency provisions as well. Um, many countries have online portals. This is something we sometimes commit as well in trade agreements. So these are elements, of course, that 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 you will find in other agreements. And, uh, I think it's at some point you could also wonder if, if something could be done between the EU and Singapore on this. But this is a new agreement just in place. Uh, trade agreements are concluded for 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 several generations initially, at least. So uh, I think a talk of an upgrade is maybe a little bit premature. But we could look into any remarks that industry might have. For example, I know that the definition of a manager doesn't just include the authority to hire and fire, but also the authority to recommend hiring and firing. Now. That is a much broader interpretation. And I think most managers at some point would have a say in who is hired and who is fired under their supervision. So uh, I think if, if you have the feeling that this gets too restrictive and, and, and the interpretation gets too narrow to the point where the commitment becomes uh, um, um, of no value, I think that's something that should be flagged already now. And that's not a matter of upgrading any agreement. That's a matter of implementation. And we would certainly be willing to look at that. Yeah. Implementation is, is the word. The European Commission, of course, has now a, a chief trade enforcement officer in an office, so implementation is, is something to watch out for. Um, Mark, um, let me ask you the same question we asked in the poll. Has access to Singapore for business people improved under the US FTA? Um, and perhaps just to follow on quickly, if you could influence the content and design of most four provisions in future FTAs, involving Singapore or others. What would you suggest they should look like to address the issues your clients are facing? So, um, well, or just uh, I, I mentioned that, that I think the authorities have been um, very transparent. They've got a, an excellent uh, portal and um, they've been you know, very upfront in, in terms of their you know, position. Um, but um, certainly I, I think it would help you know, to be able to upgrade um, the FTA to cover dependents because um, in this day and age, a lot of assignees do, do bring their dependents with them, even on fairly short assignments. And um, especially with COVID, um, you know, families want, want to be together. Um, so I, I think that's, you know, some, something which is important. Um, I think, um, you know, in the Singapore context, um, a lot of it's not enshrined in law, but it's, you know, at the discretion of, of the authorities. Um, so that's where it, it is quite tricky in terms of trying to get an exemption, um, you know, un, under the FTA. Um, so, um, you know, like, like I say, um, I, I think that, you know, Singapore is, is very much um, open to investment, open to business. Um, and so from that point of view, you know, that there are, you know, different options. It's more a question of navigating, you know, the best approach. Um. Okay. Well, uh, I think we, uh, we have 
uh, reached quite an interesting point in this discussion. I was going to ask you, Jan, about implementation in Europe, but I think we might not be able to get to that point uh, now. Um, maybe as a last question, uh, any free practical advice to go from either one of you for people who need to come to Singapore for business for a while and the companies that bring them in? So, um, I mean, we are in the middle of um, COVID. And so there is a complete travel ban on um, short term travelers. Um, so, you know, there, there is um, a need to apply for an employment pass, you know, in order to, to come to Singapore and, you know, to, to do business, etc. So um, it, it is important, you know, to, to look at, you know, what options um, there are. And also that, you know, to understand that it can take some time, um, especially for new companies. There's a lot of scrutiny of, of new companies. Um, so, um, you know, while everybody's excited about, you know, kind of investing in Singapore and doing the business, you know, immigration, you know, can be a hurdle. Um, there can be a lot of requests for additional um, information, documentation regarding the business plans, you know, contracts um, and hiring plans. So it's, it's important to be well planned um, if you're going to be sending people to Singapore. Okay, well, thanks so much, Mark. Uh, Jan, um, a last word from you. Any um, comments? Um I have no final words on 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 whether on on uh, to recommend uh, for people who are thinking to go to to Singapore. I would just maybe from from past experience uh, say that one should also pay attention to things like portability of pension rights and so on. These things are not regulated in the trade agreement, but they are very important for for a, a career uh, spanning several uh, years and, and and several continents. That's certainly something to to be mindful of if you consider a career like that. Um, and in terms of the spouses, indeed, we can look to FTAs for upgrading the rules on spouses. But um, if it is such an important part of being an attractive destination for business people, as we believe it is, you can also do that autonomously. You do not need to have an FTA in place to, to make it easier for, for spouses of intercorporate transferees to, to come. Um, the fact that they're not covered in an agreement doesn't mean they're not important for intercorporate transferees. And that is why we have included them in our domestic rules. So they are free to come and free to work in any sector. And, and if, if there's an argument to be made by expat communities or by big companies, uh, this can also be done to the Singaporean authorities and, and it doesn't need a new FTA to, to, to improve the situation there, I, I hope. Thank you so much. Thanks to both of you for, um, for this. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is all we have time for today. It's been it's been quite uh, rich. We've talked about the strategic and the pilot dimension of uh, this agreement. The ambassador uh, previously highlighted how, just how important this relationship is, uh, in particular in the context of trade and services. Um, I think in the last two uh, sessions in particular, we heard uh, how important the guarantee of openness is. I think Eugene called it the guarantee not that there will be no rollback. Um, in terms of crises or otherwise. Um, this, I believe, is an important takeaway. Um, trade agreements will usually not throw open a door that is closed, but trade agreements will help to open it a little bit more um, and, 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 and to keep it open um, when uh, things uh, may not go exactly as, as expected. They also help us um, channel our expectations uh, and not least, to, to uh, focus on what else we need to do, including uh, future upgrades. Let me conclude by saying again, uh, with the privilege of saying this on behalf of the EU delegation and the supporting team, thank you all for, for joining us uh, today. We are grateful to uh, all our speakers uh, for their participation and useful insights. We hope that the presentations and the discussions were indeed useful. I thought they were um, for uh, you and your businesses. Um, let me echo the words of the ambassador at the beginning and thank specifically Justina Lasik and her team um, and her colleagues uh, at the EU delegation who have been instrumental in putting this webinar together, including in terms of themes and content and people. Um, and thanks not least to the technical team, Laura Ashton and her team at Autos and WTS Excise.
Um, we also extend our appreciation for the support of the Singapore Ministry of Trade and Industry, uh, Shun Lung was here, um, the Singapore Business Federation, and Eurocham Singapore again. Once again, if you'd like to view uh, or share this webinar, a uh, recording will be available on the YouTube channel EU in Singapore, and the presentations will be uploaded to the delegation's uh, website at www.europe.s. We will also send an email to all the participants with the links to these materials. Thank you and have a great rest of this lovely Wednesday. Bye-bye.